Um, so welcome. My name is Catherine Colasanti here at the Center for Regional Food Systems. And I'm joined virtually by Courtney Pinar at the Gretchen Swanson Center for Nutrition Research Scientist there, as well as here next to me in the office is Christian Scott, who is an intern with us on this shared measurement project right now. And he will be um, moderating the, the questions and the comments from all of you. So welcome, this is our fourth in the series of shared measurement trainings, and we are here today to introduce a food access survey. So without further ado, all right, so, slide. so I imagine that um, many of you have been engaged at some point with the shared measurement project or have seen some of our, our writing about it, but just wanted to start with the big picture of how this fits in with the larger collective impact framework that we've been working under. And the, the gist of the collective impact framework is a way to think about how all of the different organizations that have overlapping and related goals can work together more synergistically, more effectively for greater impact. And shared measurement is one of the criteria in the collective impact framework with the idea that if we can track our progress in a common way and identify shared measures, then we can be more effective in measuring the impact of our work and compare and contrast across organizations, aggregate across organizations, and speak a common language when we're talking about the results of our work. So Courtney is going to share just a little bit of background on the Shared Measurement Project and how we got to where we are today with this webinar. Yeah, so not to um, go over in too much detail, as many of you were aware of um, the process over the last year or so, um, there is a series of interviews and um, surveys that we conducted with partners like yourself and found that um, areas of interest for shared measurement laid in economic impact of local food systems, Institu institutional procurement and access to healthy foods and related behaviors and how we kind of narrowed our way to focus on um, healthy food access for the pilot was um, just the landscape and existing um, programs going on including Cultivate Michigan um, really as a leader in institutional procurement and aligning well with shared measures and then um, building capacity around economic impact is kind of where we're starting with that piece. And some of you are probably involved with the training and um, just the Center for Regional Food Systems um, really starting to build capacity in order to assess that more effectively across the state. And so then healthy food access really laid out there as an area that cross cut many different organizations and also kind of shown as a need for primary data collection. So next slide. Just a quick reminder, some of the original goals of the Shared Measures Project and um, working through this collective impact framework was to empower communities and organizations to really understand uh, food access better and be able to address it in their work more effectively, as well um, and establishing these protocols for assessing healthy food access that can be replicated um, again and again uh, throughout the state and otherwise and really pulling from those best practices as much as possible and then um, building capacity for data collection in general is a really important um, piece because a lot of grassroots organizations out there do great work in being able to demonstrate that impact not only as a single organization, but then across uh, multiple organizations is a really effective tool for um, policy and um, getting more funding. So next slide, we'll just give a quick outline. Okay, so then today we've already um, gone over a little bit of the background, but um, Catherine will talk more about how we defined and met and how we typically measure food access, and then um, overview of what our pilot is going to look like over the next year or so. And uh, this includes cognitive interviewing, which we're doing right now, and Christian's been leading that up um, to establish the tool as a really uh, sound and 
um, powerful tool to measure what we're intending, as well as how we'll implement that survey tool through this RFA process that um, some of you might be aware of. And then we'll go through each of the scales and questions from the survey tool describing you know, why we're, we included it and what we hope to gain from it. And um, I'll mention a few additional scales and how we have flexibility built into this pilot. It's not just the, the questions that are in the core survey, but we'll have opportunities to measure things that are pertinent to various organizations. And then um, we'll provide us some basic tips for how we conduct surveys in communities and how we can find other survey tools if you know food access is in our core focus. And then like I mentioned, we'll go over the RFA and have some time for questions. And throughout, um, you please use the uh, question and answer or chat function, and um, Christian will keep an eye on that, and we'll, we'll try and loop back at multiple times throughout the presentation. So I'll pass it back to Catherine, and she'll go over some food access models. OK, thank you, Courtney. Uh, and I did see one of our participants, uh, Bridget Hall, it sounds like you, it looks like you raised your hand. So if there's a question or comment, please put that in the chat box or the Q&A box and we can respond accordingly. All right. Um, so before we get into, as Courtney said, the specific survey tool and the, the details of the request for applications, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the concept of food access. It's a term that um, if if you're in this work, you may use a lot. We tend to use a lot, and I think we tend to think of it as something simple, but it's actually quite complex. So I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about the different components um, of food access and different measurement approaches. And we'll pause again after this section for any questions or comments. And again, I want to say, too, this is a, a working model that we've um, kind of been in the process of developing with our advisory committee for the shared measurement project, but we'd really welcome any comments, questions, feedback on um, this model of healthy food access. But fundamentally, the idea of access has been defined as the ability to benefit from something. So I think we, we tend to think maybe of access as either having enough food to eat or as um, the presence of an adequate number of grocery stores in a given area. But either of those things alone are not necessarily the full concept of, of access in terms of the actual ability to obtain, to purchase, to eat, and experience positive health outcomes from healthy food. So if we break down some of the dimensions, we can think first about just the availability of stores. So are there stores nearby? Is the number of stores adequate to serve the population? Is there an appropriate mix of store types? You'll see some studies that look at the ratio of what might be termed healthy food retail outlets versus convenience stores or versus fast food restaurants. Um, common methodologies use spatial analyses to look at the location of stores. Uh, versus population centers of census tracts or neighborhoods. Ratio of store types I mentioned can also utilize surveys, interviews, or focus groups to ask people their perceived store availability. So are they aware of stores in their neighborhood? Um, store adequacy then goes beyond just the physical presence of the store to look at the characteristics of a store so are there stores that are selling an appropriate variety of high quality, healthy food at affordable prices? And again, even just that question embeds several concepts, right? Variety, quality, affordability. Um, are the stores selling culturally appropriate food for residents of that area? Are residents comfortable shopping in the stores? What's the level of customer service? What are the relationships like between store customers and store owners? Um, are stores accepting food assistance benefits, SNAP, WIC, or other programs? Um, so methodologies here involve store assessments, so actually going into a store and looking at the variety, quality, or prices of foods being sold. You could look at just the number of SNAP or WIC licensed stores in a given area. And then again, um, 
could talk to residents directly through surveys, interviews, or focus groups and ask them perceptions of the adequacy of stores. Um, the, the next piece in this working model is on socio-demographics. So what are the characteristics of residents themselves? So assuming there are stores present, assuming the stores are adequate or are providing good, healthy options, do residents have the ability to get there and do they have the resources to afford the food that is being sold? So what's the level of car ownership, for example? Um, what's the level of food insecurity? Do residents just in general have the resources they need to, to access the available food? Uh, this could involve secondary data analysis on poverty rates, on food insecurity, car ownership. A lot of that data is found in the census. Um, and then again, asking people on the perceived ease of accessing healthy food. It sounds like we have a, a question. Are food pantries, pre-food distribution sites, things like the like included when talking about stores? And food yeah, that's a good question. So um, the question on food pantry sites absolutely could be included in, in looking at the availability of resources. And I didn't mean that specifically in this model but I think that's absolutely something that, that can and should be included. Um, and then you could look at what are residents actually um, purchasing, what are the shopping patterns, or again, if you wanna look at food pantries, food banks, you could look at what are they acquiring through those types of sites. So where are residents shopping, how often, um, and what are residents purchasing? So here, again, you could look um, at what sales, volume, or category of specific items you see in stores from a given area. You could ask residents to self-report shopping patterns or self-report what they're purchasing. Uh, a few studies go so far as to collect receipts from all store purchases for a given time period. Obviously, that's a very labor-intensive method. Another question? So. The request was for me to speak more clearly. Uh, the question was, are food pantries, food distribution sites, and the like included when talking about stores and food access? Um, and Catherine indicated that it absolutely can and should be included. Okay. Did you guys hear Christian's comment? OK. okay. Yeah. okay. And then finally, what are the ultimate, um, so looking at our stores available, are they adequate? What are the socio-demographics? What are people buying? What are stores selling? Um, ultimately brings us to what's the actual dietary behavior. So what are people eating and what are the health outcomes as a result? So questions here, what are residents eating? What's the level of nutrition knowledge? What are obesity rates? What are rates of diet-related disease? or level of health disparities between different, different demographic groups. Uh, methodologies here could involve secondary um, data analysis, either at national or state level. We have um, available databases on consumption. We have also state level data on obesity, diet-related disease, and health disparities. Those databases are not detailed enough to look at um, count more, more detailed geographic areas, typically. And then you could also look at self-reported consumption patterns or nutrition knowledge or, or health status. Um, and then I also wanted to share this concept of food access, which was developed by um, Dr. Kareem Usher from Ohio State University presented this model, which drew from the uh, 1981 article that I have referenced at the bottom of the slide there, which developed a concept of access as related to healthcare. And then Dr. Usher um, adapted that to fit to food access. So this is a lot of a similar concept, but to what I just shared, but sliced and diced in a little bit different way, but fundamentally getting at the level of fit between the food acquisition sites, the food resources in a community, and what residents need and want. 
So thinking about acceptability, the relationship between res residents and store associates, customer service, um, accessibility relates to transportation resources, perceived burden of transportation time, the store locations. Um, you could look to a transportation, public transportation systems, accommodation, store hours, residents' ability to meet those hours, uh, affordability, prices, the income of residents, acceptance of SNAP or other benefits, and then finally, availability, volume and variety of healthy food and the consistency of that availability. So again, I just wanted to share um, some of these different ways of thinking about food access, um, just to give everyone a sense of all of the, the dimensions that are possible to look at, all of the different ways that are possible to approach measuring food access. Uh, just to provide the understanding of, of how complex a concept it really is. So we can pause there for any further questions or comments on defining and measuring food access, and then I'll go into the survey tool itself. Do we have any other questions at this time? Okay. Okay, well, if something does occur to you, feel free to put that in either the chat box or the Q&A box. Oh, all right. Okay. Um, all right, so Heather Cole asks, will these slides be available after the webinar? Yes, they will. Um, yeah, we can make both slides available in the, the recording. We are recording. And Cheryl Stanley asks, where is cultural appropriateness? Yeah, thank you. Cultural appropriateness um, is something that we address specifically in the survey tool, so we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, in the model that I presented first, see if I can go back to that. Um, I have that in this concept of store adequacy. So are stores selling culturally appropriate food is one of the possible questions you could look at. Um, and then in this second model, I would, let's see, I think that would be under, well, you could probably put it either under availability. It looks like it would be the best fit there. And just to note, it's not in the core group of survey items that Catherine's going to go through next, but it is an option for groups that are interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. The, the perceived availability of culturally appropriate food is not in the core group of questions, but it is um, something that we include in a question on what are the motivating factors um, or what are the factors that that people take into account when deciding where to grocery shop. Uh, another question is, can you expand on acceptability, the relationship between residents and association? Yeah, so a, a question to expand on the concept of acceptability. So that is more the social dynamic as I, I take it, and I haven't spoken with Dr. Usher about this model. I've just read his article in um, Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems, and Community Development, but the way he talks about it, my understanding is it's, um, are our customers, do they feel safe? Do they feel comfortable when shopping in a store? Do they feel like they're fairly treated by store owners and employees? Some of those concepts. Okay, well, I'm going to um, move on to an overview of the pilot and then talking about the survey tool itself. But again, happy to take additional questions on concepts of food access and measurement um, approaches if, if they occur to people. So um, we are 
in this process of developing a survey tool to assess perceived food access. And we'll again go into detail on those questions in just a moment. But the bigger picture process behind that, um, we've been already through a number of rounds of review of that tool with first our advisory committee for the shared measurement project with several expert reviewers in the field that Courtney had contacts with. And now we're in the process of conducting cognitive interviews with the tool. And Christian Scott, who I introduced at the beginning, is leading that process. And what a cognitive interview does is provides us an opportunity to sit down with somebody and walk through that tool and ask that person to share what they're thinking as they read the questions and as they formulate their responses. So it's really a way to make sure that the survey tool is understandable by the target population and also um, going to provide us with, with the types of answers that we're really looking for. So we have now completed three of those cognitive interviews and already made a number of changes to the questions to make them as clear as possible, to make them as, as simple and easy to read as possible, um, because part of this process is also about minimizing just the, the cognitive burden, if you will, on respondents of the survey, so to, to make it really easy to understand. Um, and, and then again, just honing in on what data we're actually going to glean from the tool. So we will be completing at least a couple more rounds of cognitive interviews and making successive changes to the, the survey questions until we get to a place where we really feel like it's going to provide us that with the data that we want and it's going to be um, as understandable as possible. And then that will lead into the 2016 pilots. Again, we'll be sharing more about the request for applications to participate in those pilots here on this webinar today. And then concurrently with those pilots, so we have resources to support up to three communities in 2016 to participate and implement the survey tool. But we're also happy to let others use the survey tool as well, whether they have their own resources to conduct a full-scale survey analogous to what the pilot communities will be doing, or whether they just want to use a few of the questions and incorporate those into another survey process that they may already have. Um, let's see, Christian tells me somebody, or I think it was Cheryl Danley I saw raised, raised her hand. So Cheryl, if you have a question or comment, please type that in and we can respond. So once, again, once we're, comfortable with a final survey tool, we will make that available to anyone who wants to use that. And then in 2017, we anticipate that we will also have resources to support an additional three pilot communities. And at this point, our intention is to support um, piloting the tool in rural areas. And then we would also like to use a subset of questions from the survey tool at the state level so that while we do a deeper dive in assessing food access in the pilot communities, we're also getting a bigger picture sense of food access, perceived food access um, at the state level. And then ultimately, the, the goal is for the tool, as Courtney said at the beginning, to be one that is adaptable for communities across the state that can be utilized when people are wanting to do a, an assessment of food access in their community and can be incorporated into a lot of existing tools. Okay, so now moving on to the survey tool itself. So these are screenshots from the survey software and we are planning to use Qualtrics. So it starts with a yes or no question. I do most of the food shopping in my household. Okay, Christian tells me we have a question. Um, what is the scale of a community, town, township, or county? Yeah, okay, so the question was, what is the scale of a community? And that's a great question. Um, we will work with the, the groups that are selected for the pilot to identify specifically a, a target neighborhood, but we are envisioning a sub-municipal level. Um, so the target number of surveys 250 to 400 and in order to get a, 
um, a really representative sample of a given area, that's not going to be enough surveys to look at, let's say, all of the city of Lansing. So what we want to do is work with the selected communities to hone in on an area that we expect to see a high level of challenges around food access. So I, I don't have a perfect answer in terms of um, you know, acres at this point, but, but that's, that's what I can share. Courtney, anything to add on that? Um, yeah, in the RFA, didn't we define this first round, this pilot, the three communities would be at least 10,000? Yeah, sorry, yeah. So, so there's two, two scales to think about. So we do want to work in this first round with communities that do have an urban core population of at least 10,000. Um, and then within that community, the access yeah. survey will be targeted at a smaller neighborhood. And then, you know, like you mentioned in 2017, then we'll start to think about more rural communities. Right. Okay, so back to the survey tool. Um, so asking people whether they do most of the food shopping in their household, and that's just so that we understand the, the frame of reference and the perspective of the respondent. And then asking people, where where they shop or where they get their food because this question it does include food food pantries food banks or, or soup kitchens so in the past month how often did you or your household get food from the following place and then we list several categories of stores or food acquisition sites and then this is essentially a continuation of the same question but the difference is that we are emphasizing during the growing season since seasonal availability affects um, these two sites, farmers markets or directly from a farm or household or community garden. So those are the questions on food acquisition patterns. And then we get into actual perceived food availability. So the ease that people perceive in their ability to access fruits and vegetables and Michigan grown foods. So asking specifically about, is it easy to find fresh fruits and vegetables within my neighborhood? And we're defining that as the area you can easily walk, bike, drive, or take the bus to. And um, whether fruits and vegetables in the neighborhood are high quality. And the selection of Michigan grown foods. Do we have a question? Yes. Um, have you looked into working with urban WIC offices, or are you currently piloting from there? Um, question on, have we looked into working with WIC offices? Um, we, we've we just released the request for applications and we're open to piloting with anybody who's interested in applying. So we have not um, pursued specific partnerships beyond that. But I, I, one thing that I would like to do after um, we get the, the pilot applications rolling is work with specific groups who who may have an interest or ability in conducting this survey or incorporating pieces of it um, with their own resources or with their own data collection processes. So it, the WIC offices might be one of those. I'm, I don't know enough about um, their current data collection processes or capacities, but if you do, I'd be happy to talk with you more offline about that. And then um, we move in the survey tool to asking um, factor about factors that influence shopping patterns. So here we ask, what is most important to you in deciding where to grocery shop? And this is the question I was referring to um, when the question about culturally appropriate food came up, because that is one factor that we list. Uh, so there are, I think it's nine different factors here. And then also an other option. Um, and these are randomized automatically in the survey so that the order isn't unduly influencing responses. And then we ask um, agreement with the statement, I have easy access to a store that meets my needs, or that, uh, in other words, that has the characteristics I indicated above as important. And again, thinking about a neighborhood as somewhere that you can easily walk, bike, drive, or take the bus to. And then we ask about transportation barriers 
specifically. So how often is transportation a problem for you on the scale of always to never? And how often does the distance from your home to a full service grocery store make it difficult for you to buy fruits and vegetables you would like on the same response scale? And then we get into dietary patterns. So these are a series of 10 questions asking um, about how often fruits and vegetables in these different categories are consumed. So juice and fruit, tomato products, and then green salads, potatoes, beans, and other vegetables. So they're, they might seem like oddly specific questions, but they're trying to reflect how people tend to think about um, these different foods. And then ultimately the, the goal in this series of questions is to translate into um, a cup equivalent level of consumption. And I, I will say um, this series of questions has been utilized in other tools, so it has been well vetted, but it is something that we're still considering in, in terms of incorporating in this survey tool specifically, because it is 10 questions long. It is um, a large set of questions and there are a lot of answer choices and the words of wording of the questions is fairly lengthy. So during our cognitive interview process, we want to hone in on the ease that respondents have in being able to answer these questions. Because I think we're still considering the possibility of paring down our questions about fruit and vegetable consumption to a, a smaller number of questions. Pausing for a question. So actually, the, this question is related to that. Okay. Um, what is the readability score of this survey? Um, the questions seem a bit advanced for someone with limited literacy. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, during the cognitive interview process, I've noticed that too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so that is really why we wanted to do the cognitive interview process. And I have to say, even just having done now three of these, Christian has led these. I'm really happy that we've taken the time to um, conduct the cognitive interviews before executing the pilot because we do really want to make sure that they are readable. Um, and then I will say also that the actual, when we get to the pilot phase and we are implementing the survey, we're envisioning a face-to-face -face interaction between the interviewer and the survey respondent. And in some cases, I think that could happen where the, the survey respondent, um, we haven't talked about the, this process yet, but the survey will be administered via iPad, iPad minis. Um, so in some cases, the respondent might just utilize the iPad and key in all of his or her responses individually. But in other cases, it could be that the interviewer, whoever's collecting the data, keys in the responses. So there is an opportunity for that person to help clarify questions as needed. Courtney, did you want to comment on that? Oh, I just wanted to reiterate that with the cognitive interviews, we're really honing in on simplifying the language. And as Catherine mentioned, with the fruit and vegetable screener, um, although it's the standard that's out there, um, the two items that we're looking to replace these 10 items with are much more straightforward. So it's a really big priority to make it um, appropriate to a variety of literacy levels. Yeah. Um, so assuming we stayed with the, the 10 question set on dietary patterns, the additional questions with the same response scale as the previous slide would be um, asking about consumption of Mexican type salsa made with tomato, uh, consumption of pizza, and other tomato products such as spaghetti um, or foods mixed with uh, like lasagna with sauce. And then the final set is on consumption of green salads, potatoes, beans, and other vegetables. So you can see those on the screen. I don't need to read all of those. And then the next series of questions on the survey ask about sociodemographics. So we have a question on um, have you received any of the following benefits currently or in the past two years? 
So we have a number of different benefits. And this is a way both to assess poverty level of the respondents, but also to get a sense of participation level in, in benefits. So for communities who want to use this tool to assess um, possible interventions in response to the level of food access challenges, I think having a sense of participation level in the different benefits, particularly WIC or SNAP would be helpful. And then finally, and I, these are more straightforward questions, so I didn't um, type out the specific language, but we are asking about age, gender, Hispanic, Latino, and or Spanish, background of race, household income by category, um, number of adults in the household, and number of children in the household. And having those figures will then allow us to calculate um, the, the poverty level. And then also zip code. And we have that set up so that we could customize response options based on the, the community that the survey would be implemented in. And then finally, just an open-ended question. I, when I do surveys, I always like to throw in, especially if there are no other open-ended questions, something at the end, just in case someone has a burning comment. Um, in this case, I wouldn't expect that to be completed very often, but just to have that as an option. And then, um, because I mentioned those two different options in terms of how the survey would be administered, we wanted to be able to document that. So whether the survey was completed by the respondent alone or the interviewer assisted. So those are the core questions and now I'm gonna turn it to Courtney to go over the, the questions that we would provide as potential optional additional questions. And I should say too that we're also open to working with the, the pilot communities to add in questions that are of specific interest to them. Right, so we're um, flexible with designing the survey. Those core items, we really wanted to hone in on what was identified as the most central and um, important to a wide variety of potential organizations so that we can't have that shared aspect. And then these other options are um, potentially relevant as well. And there may be others. So in a few slides, I will ask, um, for ideas on other types of scales that people are interested in so that we can make sure we address that with some of these optional scales. So the first one is um, pretty common, the USDA food security module, and this is the six item version um, shown here as a um, self-report format. Usually the module, if you download it from the USDA website, is in an interview format, but this one um, will allow you to categorize um, the population into um, very low food security, low food security, and moderate and um, high food security. So um, that's kind of a standard um, used across the country and especially in um, uh, surveillance type data. So next slide. Um, this is an example of a scale that we've been working on here in Omaha. We've used it for two years now, going on to our third year in a hunger initiative. And it really is to complement the food security module, and it's to get at hunger coping. So um, this scale here is um, regarding trade-offs that people make when they're deciding to or having to pay for food and then trade-offs that they have to make in order to pay for it. So, you know, paying for food versus paying for utilities or medical costs. And then there are two additional scales that are um, to this I didn't include on the slide that are financial coping. So um, things like um, borrowing money to buy food or pawning items, belongings to buy food. And then the a third being um, rationing, so hiding food or stretching food in various ways. So those scales um, are available and just a nice complement to the food security module because we found that it isn't as sensitive to change. We don't really know a lot what's going on in households and communities um, at a more behavioral level. So next scale. And then this is the cultural relevancy item. Um, it kind of gets at more of whether the foods available in the community are relevant culturally to those families. So in particular, this might be relevant to neighborhoods with particular underrepresented minority groups. 
and just really asking, do the stores in that community offer foods that are common to these cultures? And that um, also complements to the one item that Catherine highlighted before that's in the core survey, that this is a driving factor to making food decisions. So next slide. So now, um, I'm not sure, I think it may probably in the group chat, if people have ideas of scales that they think are important or things that we haven't really touched on yet related to food access, we'd love to hear um, these ideas. If you wanna take a minute to write those in. And then also feel free to type in, we can pause for questions now as well. Um, any questions about the core survey or the optional scales or how it will work in the pilot, Catherine's going to go through the RFA um, in the process a little bit more, but if you have any questions specific to how the survey will be implemented, I'd be, we'd be happy to talk some more right now. So if anyone has any other suggestions, um, you can follow up with us. Um, also, as we you know start putting this out there, um, if there are things that you're looking at that are important, um, I think it's good to have that communication back and forth so that if we're recommending one scale to a group that we can also recommend that same scale to another group so that there is that shared aspect if there was potential down the line to, to combine those. Uh, so we have another question. How have other programs, like dedicated bus, fresh produce in a convenience store, impacted your diet? So I think that's a suggested scale, I think. Is what okay. Was. Sorry. Okay. Okay, well, um, feel free to um, add some more ideas there, but we can keep moving forward here. Okay. Next slide. Um, so this is a little bit of review if you've been on previous um, webinars, but just a quick overview of how we go about conducting surveys in communities. So you may not be solely interested in food access and you want to know how can I um, conduct these surveys with the same amount of rigor. And so also thinking as a starting point before you even get to step one is, you know, what was, was there any qualitative data that was collected, so uh, interviews and focus groups that, you, that you're building from, and that this survey can also complement. So we start by reviewing existing measures um, and when possible aligning with any national surveys because then you can compare your sample and your community to your county, to your state, to your uh, national, which is a nice comparison when showing where the need is. Um, and then considering who's um, used this survey before? How, which communities has it been tested in? Is it valid in rural communities? Is it valid in different cultural and ethnic groups? And then we think about the wording level. We already talked about, someone brought up the important point about literacy level, understandability, interpretability. That's hopefully being addressed through the cognitive interviews at this point with our survey. And um, just simple things like keeping the question straightforward, asking one question at a time and um, providing the appropriate context so you may have to change their frame of mind. Okay, now we're going to be talking about what you eat on a day daily basis or what you typically eat, however the phrasing is. Um, and then with response options, I see a lot of groups out there using yes, no questions, which can limit interpretation depending on um, the type of scale it is. So you can sometimes get that bigger variety and ability to do um, more analyses and really understand what the population is with a Likert scale, so like a one to five. Um, most yes, no questions can be converted really easily to a Likert. You know, how much do you agree with these statements with one being just dis strongly disagree to five being uh, strongly agree. And then considering the future of the scale and or the survey and how you will score things, what, what will the analyses mean, how, how do you want to report that out to your stakeholders, because then you may think of other questions that you maybe wanted to ask that are important for communication. 
And then this slide, um, I won't go through in too much detail, but there are a number of sources out there that list and have searchable databases on survey tools that, and they identify, you know, how they've been used in the past and where they're available. And some of these ones I've listed here are relevant to the food environment and specific to topics that um, may be important to you, like farm to school or um, healthy healthy food environments and communities. Um, and I'll just show uh, as an example on the next slide, the NCOR measures registry is a good example of, you can really narrow down your search. So if you wanted to look at a questionnaire that gets at the food environment that's relevant for adults and rural, then you can go through some of these examples and then on each of these pages would be um, links to it and more information on that scale. Right. And so now um, Catherine will provide an overview of the, re the request for applications, the RFA that um, we've been talking about. Okay. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so if you haven't seen the RFA come through on email, you can find that on the Center for Regional Food Systems website. So that's foodsystems.msu.edu. And if you look under news, it should be one of the first three uh, at least. Um, news items, or you can just email Courtney and I after this and we can send that to you. But applications are due at the end of this month, so you have just over two weeks. And we hope to support three communities to each collect between 250 and 400 surveys. And again, we'll work with those communities to develop sampling plans, but we would be looking for a balance of low income, underrepresented minority groups. Um, in a high need area. And then we would be analyzing both the aggregate results across those pilot communities as well as conducting community specific analyses and working with those selected communities on what that analysis looks like and how those results are communicated and providing training throughout the whole process to, again, going back to the goals, for the pilot that Courtney shared at the beginning really build up capacity for participation in data collection like this and conducting surveys and analyzing and reporting, communicating the results. Uh, so some of the, the key things in the RFA, um, again, in this year for 2016, we are looking to support implementation in a large or medium-sized city with an urban core population of at least 10,000. Um, we do need to work with people who are willing to share the data with the Center for Regional Food Systems. The platform that we'll be utilizing <coughs> is with Qualtrics. It's a survey software, and we would be granting an account to that program to the selected communities, but we also have a, an account. So basically, um, both the pilot communities and CRFS would have access to the raw data. Um, and then we can't fund individuals. We would need to work with a, a U.S. business entity that is located in Michigan. Um, Christian says we have a question. Is that right? No, sorry. That was an old question. Sorry. Um, um, and then the, the budget that we have allocated for the pilots is $5,800. And we designed that budget um, thinking that we really wanted to provide sufficient resources for the data collection itself, so for the, the staff time involved in, in going out and talking to people to conduct the survey, for the mileage reimbursement, for any um, travel involved, and then for the survey incentives. So $5 for anyone who completes the survey just as an immediate cash incentive. So those are the, the budget priorities. Um, and then the basic process, again, working with the Gretchen Swanson Center and Center for Regional Food Systems to, to plan um, using iPad minis that we would provide to administer the survey in person. And then, again, we would work with you to analyze and report the data. And we're also um, in the process of developing a contract with the University of Michigan who is interested in supporting the selected communities to develop an infographic-based report so we would have a visual way to share the results of the survey and to provide some training on how to develop infographics for use in the future. 
Um, and then on the application itself, we're looking for a max of six pages. That doesn't mean you have to write six pages. Uh, brevity is always a good thing. We won't penalize those who are, are shorter in their applications. It, so don't, don't feel like you have to fill out six pages. Um, and, and this is all spelled out in the RFA, but the first part of the application, we'd just be looking for a summary page with some of the basics. So what is the community of interest? What's the municipality? If you have an idea of a neighborhood within that city or town, um, in one sentence, what's your overarching objective or goals for participating in the pilot? Who would the actual um, grant recipient be? What would the organization be? And then who would be the people involved? Who can we be in touch with? And then what we're looking for so the components of the application narrative are on the right-hand column and on the left-hand column is what we will be um, reviewing when we're actually looking at the applications and we have a review committee of four people set up to um, assess the applications that come in. So significance or, or background, so tell us about the community, why is this a good community for looking at food access, what do you already know about your community? either from secondary data, from previously collected primary data, or just from your on the ground experience. Um, capacity, we don't expect all of the participating organizations to have expertise in these things. Again, we wanna provide any support that's needed throughout the process, but we do need uh, an organization or a group of people who at least have the ability and the commitment to see the project through you know we want it to to be a success and to be completed um, what what's your approach what are your strategies for for taking on the project and who do you plan to work with and what is your history of working um, with those partners what's your history of working in the, the community um, we want this to be really embedded in, in the community and it will certainly work best if, um, if this is not your first time working in, in the community. And, um, we, we want the, the, the process and the results to be vetted and shared and discussed through community partnerships, through dialogue with other organizations who, who have the history in the community, who work with residents, who represent residents. So that it can really be a collaborative project and so that there can be a, a home for um, guiding the process and for interpreting the results. And then we also, we want this tool to be useful for the, the participating communities and to provide information that can be acted on. So for our purposes, we do want to test out the tool. And as we said at the beginning, you know, develop something that will be adaptable across the state and in, in, in different contexts. But we really, for your sake, want it to be something that's useful. So how does conducting this survey fit into your longer term vision for addressing food access or food systems development in the community? Uh, so the timeline, um, again, the applications due at the end of this month, and then we would review and announce the recipients by April 15th. So we envision a six-month timeline for the pilot with a month of planning, four months or so of data collection, and then a month of analysis and reporting. And so that brings us to next step. So depending on your level of interest, if you want to um, submit a pilot application, we would love to work with you to do that. Again, March 31st is the deadline. Um, if you don't think you want to complete or participate in the pilot, but you might be interested in utilizing the survey tool in another context or incorporating a few of the questions, uh, stay tuned as we finalize that tool and then make that available for those who are interested. Or if you just want to stay in the loop with what's happening, we'd, we'd love to, um, to have, yeah, to, to keep you in the loop, I guess is what I should say. So we will be continuing to report out through, um, through Foodspeak Listserv. I have a specific database of people who just want to stay in the loop on a shared measurement project. So if you want to be in that list of people, feel free to email me. 
um, and then also through the michiganfood.org and the Michigan Good Food Charter newsletter, we'll put out periodic updates there too. So that brings us to the conclusion of our uh, prepared comments. There is court contact info for both Courtney and I, and I think we have just a few more minutes for questions. Okay. So could I ask, uh, um, so Catherine and Courtney both touched, or Catherine touched on this a little bit in this just immediately previous to this, but could I ask for both of you um, kind of the so what, what is the benefit to a community or the organization or the individuals applying for this? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the benefit? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll take a say about that, and then Courtney, you can also chime in. Um, I think the benefit for a community is, is information is power and I think can be motivating. So I, I hope that this is an opportunity. I know it's not a lot of money, but I hope it is enough to provide an opportunity for a community to collect some information that is useful in terms of um, could be planning specific strategies to address food access or or um, gathering that background data that would enable a community to seek a greater level of funding to go after larger grants to look at food access or food system issues and motivate the community, motivate other partners to, to build up relationships around this work. Um, I hope that it could also be an opportunity to further establish relationships around food access, hunger, food insecurity, and community food systems development. It might be a great opportunity to work with or galvanize a food council if there is one in your community already, or maybe there's a group of people who are interested in, in forming one. I think a lot of councils have started with some sort of an assessment, so this might be a, a good opportunity for that. That, that was well said. Um, I'll just add, just on a really basic level, the, the resources for people to go out and collect data because in the interviews and surveys, people were very interested in data and this particular topic and wanting to do more, but just operating on a shoestring budget typically. So an opportunity to do that and really launch into more food access work. And then um, collectively, just having a shared voice to advance food system work in general, especially in Michigan. So, so another question: um, Would a pilot be accepted that included an initial survey, an intervention, and then a follow-up survey? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So our immediate resources are just for the pilot survey, but if you um, you identified your longer term plans, I think that would really be an asset to an application. And, you know, I think I, at least for one, would like to continue to seek funding to support greater implementation of, um, of the survey to do either follow up surveys or um, extend the number of communities that we're able to implement the survey in. So I guess the, the short answer is we don't have immediate resources for follow-up surveys, but we would love to work with you to identify resources to do that. Yeah, and I, and I guess it just depends on the timing. So you know, like the little flow chart that Catherine showed before. So when we do anticipate your baseline or follow-up, and maybe it could be either one of those um, that would contribute towards the shared measured aspect, as long as you know the sample was within the, the scope of the project, that 250 to 400. Yeah. Um, another question is, can you expand on the criteria for a neighborhood within the target urban area? I have a couple neighborhoods in mind. However, Battle Creek is rather segregated, and I'm not sure we get a diverse group of surveys without scanning the entire city. Good question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you hear that, Courtney? Yeah, and I think the short answer is that we understand these kind of complications and complexities rather, um, and that 
once awarded, we hope to work with the communities to really define that more specifically. So as long as you have an idea, you know, who you want to be assessing and why, um, the specifics on sampling and making sure that we have this representative sample, um, I think we can work with you on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't have a, a good answer right off. Okay. Well, it's just past three o'clock. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on this webinar today. Again, feel free to get in touch with Courtney or I if you have further questions. Um, as I said, we did record this webinar and we will post that to the CRFS website. It, there is a little bit of a lag in doing that. So if you are someone who wants to apply for this pilot and you want to either review this webinar again yourself or pass it on to a colleague, um, why don't you get in touch with me and I can send you a, a direct unedited link to the recording. Um, but otherwise, it'll probably be a, a week or so before we get that posted to the center's website. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon.